Well, you saw the piece. It's always very emotional when you watch it, whether you've watched it one time or, or many times. But again, I want to take this moment again to thank our exclusive program sponsor, Marymount Treatment Center, for making this possible. We'd also like to recognize those who have been brave enough, courageous enough to share their story. And some of you are among us in the audience. If you could please stand um, so you could be recognized. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Snyder, Policy and Communication Director for the Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. And Jason will then introduce our special guest, Director Michael Botticelli. Jason. There it is. <laughs> um, again, thanks very much for having me. It, uh, really is a great honor. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, given my personal experience with uh, the disease of addiction, it's almost surreal for me to stand here today uh, and have been asked to do uh, what I'm about to do. The deaths of my only siblings, uh, two brothers, to heroin overdoses and my own recovery from addiction have in large part uh, given me this opportunity to be here today. While my recovery from uh, addiction to prescription pain medications and those losses uh, of my brothers has afforded me great opportunity, those deaths have also uh, badly damaged a family. Two parents married nearly 45 years to each other this year uh, have holes in their hearts that will absolutely never heal. And sorrow and agony that I believe they have never been able to fully articulate to me or even to each other. Uh, it is really indescribable grief. Those deaths obviously have also left me without my brothers, uh, have left me with regrets, guilt, uh, what ifs, should haves. As I continue to come to understand the enormity, complexity, and significance of those losses more than 11 years after Todd's death, and more than eight years after Josh's death, uh, I believe certainly there is uh, a hole in my soul as well that will remain forever. But despite the sadness, uh, there is joy and hope. Uh, my recovery from addiction has given my parents uh, a complete son, one who is present with them every time he is with them. My recovery from the disease of addiction has given me a beautiful life today the opportunity to work under Secretary Gary Tennis, who has led this department since it was created in 2012. I, I have been afforded great opportunities. My life uh, is, is really, for me, unimaginable, given where I was uh, five years ago. And though my younger brothers were taken from me by this disease, my recovery has actually given me millions of brothers and sisters in this country who also walked the path of recovery from addiction with me. More than 23 million, as Secretary Tennis noted, more than 23 million brothers and sisters in recovery from the disease of addiction. Today, it's my honor to introduce one of those brothers to you. 27 years ago, Michael Botticelli was given the gift of recovery from addiction to alcohol in the basement of a church through a 12-step program. Since then, he has steadily climbed to the pinnacle of this nation's drug policy efforts. In February of 2015, Mr. Botticelli was sworn in at the White House as Director of National Drug Control Policy. In that role, Mr. Botticelli leads the Obama administration's drug policy efforts. In response to the national opioid epidemic in which we find ourselves today, Mr. Botticelli has led the federal effort to reduce prescription drug abuse, heroin use, and related overdoses. He has led ONDCP in, sub in supporting community-based prevention efforts, educating prescribers and the public about preventing prescription drug abuse, 
expanding use of the life-saving overdose reversal drug naloxone, which we've heard about already today, by law enforcement and other first responders. And he has led the effort to increase access to medication-assisted treatment and recovery support services to help individuals sustain their recovery from opioid use disorders. Mr. Botticelli has more than two decades of experience supporting Americans affected by substance use disorders. Before he joined ONDCP, he served as director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, where he successfully expanded innovative and nationally recognized prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I had the pleasure to introduce, I'm sorry, I had the pleasure to uh, meet Mr. Botticelli uh, several months ago and uh, have also had the pleasure to see him in a recent 60 Minutes interview. Uh, in that interview, Mr. Botticelli spoke about the destigmatizing of the disease of addiction. As he knows, simply calling it addiction a disease and describing the disease process, the way it affects the brain, is simply not enough in the fight against stigma. It will take much more. It will take those living lives of recovery to step into the spotlight and be willing to share their stories, their experience, strength, and hope. Not only is Director Botticelli setting sound, effective drug policy, but he is setting an example for how those in recovery can help to overcome the stigma surrounding the disease. That very stigma prevents people from getting into treatment and getting into recovery, as we heard today. Director Botticelli is an example of what we need to do and what we can accomplish by sharing our stories and demonstrating that addiction can and does affect anyone, but also that treatment works and recovery is possible. As I said earlier, it is really my privilege and my honor, and uh, I am very, very proud to be here today to introduce to you now Michael Botticelli, the Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jason, for that kind introduction uh, and for being such a great advocate for treatment and recovery and for taking up our call to talk about your story personally uh, so that we can change hearts and minds and how we deal with this. Your personal story is incredibly inspiring, and I appreciate how open you are about this. Uh, I also want to thank Denise uh, and NBC Philadelphia and the National Constitution Center and Miramont Treatment Centers for sponsoring today's incredibly important uh, forum and panel. And uh, particularly thanking our panelists for coming today. Uh, their stories and their perspective on this issue is uh, truly important. And I'm really blessed to be uh, here with many folks who I've uh, been enjoined with this battle for many, many years. Uh, and your commitment and your passion to deal with this becomes incredibly important to all of us. So I'm really thrilled uh, to be here today. And I, you know, I have to say on a personal note, I've been in recovery for a very, very long time, and I've been doing this work for a very long time, but I watched this incredible reporting, and I think all of us can't help but be moved, uh, be moved by the tragedy of this epidemic, but also be moved by the hope of this epidemic and the solutions that we have here. And that's why we're here today, because we are not powerless in this epidemic. We do know what works, and our, our response, our ability to work together at the federal, state, and local level, our work and our response to come together as community members public health, public safety, is where our solutions lie. So I'm really grateful to be here today. I, I think you all know the magnitude of the problem. And in 2014, over 1,000 people in Pennsylvania died from an overdose involving an opioid, either a prescription drug or uh, heroin. And drug overdoses killed more than twice the number of people in Pennsylvania that year than motor vehicle crashes. So we know that this is an incredible epidemic and a real crisis that affects every sector of our community, both public health and public safety. As the director of the National Drug Control Policy, I'm charged with carrying out President Obama's drug policy and working to find solutions to the opioid overdose epidemic. And some of those solutions are happening right here in Philadelphia. 
The President has made clear that addressing this crisis is a top priority for his administration. I think many of you saw just a couple of weeks ago, the President was in uh, Atlanta uh, addressing a uh, conference on prescription drugs where we talked about our federal response. And he's ensured that we continue to support and make sure that our approach is grounded in public health more than ever before. That's why he's proposed $1.1 billion to expand treatment so that everyone who needs it can get it. Today, we're going to build on the President's work and talk about solutions. But we do know what works. We know that preventing drug use from ever beginning is the most effective way to reduce addiction and overdose deaths. We also know that treatment is key to recovery and that for many people, medication-assisted treatment is underutilized in many places and is a critical tool to help people sustain their recovery. And we saw that featured uh, in the segment here. Uh, as Jason's talked about, you know, we can have all the treatment that we want, but stigma, unfortunately, still attaches uh, too much uh, to those who have a substance use disorder. And we know that that stigma prevents people from being referred to and getting the care that they need, delaying care, and often uh, postponing care. Solving this problem is going to take a collaboration among federal, state, local governments, community, public health, public safety organization, all working together toward a common goal. So we're gonna have a great discussion today about what's working and what more we can do. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Denise. Thank you. It's time now to bring the rest of our panelists up to the stage, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to Patty Dorenzo, a mother and member of the Camden County Heroin Task Force. <laughs> Dr. Arthur Evans, Commissioner of Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. <laughs> Fred Heron, the Director of Public Safety in Ben Salem Township. Vince Latanzio, NBC10 reporter and a critical part of our special Generation Addicted. And Devin Reeves, clinical outreach coordinator at Life of Purpose Treatment and owner of Brotherly Love House, a recovery home for young men in Philadelphia. Thank you all so much for being here. I think um, we heard from Director Botticelli why he's so close to this issue and, and what he um, hopes, to, hopes to do in the, in the coming you know, future years. Um, but I'd like to hear from each of you, just take a couple minutes to explain how this epidemic has touched you and has affected you. Patty? Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my son Sal suffered with substance misuse from his early teens. He started out with marijuana, which led to prescription pills, and then on to heroin. Um, we tried desperately to get Sal treatment, long-term treatment, but we're never able to get him the treatment that he needed due to insurance barriers. And on September 23rd, 2010, uh, Sal was found in my car in Camden of an overdose. Uh, we're not certain, but it appeared that there may have been someone with Sal at the time of his death, but they didn't call 911 to report it. So I'm guessing that was because they are afraid of being arrested. And uh, due to the circumstances surrounding Sal's death, I felt like something needed to be done, and I began to advocate in New Jersey for 911 legislation. And on May 2nd of 2013, it was signed into law, and it's now known as the Overdose Prevention Act. And it grants immunity to someone who, in good faith, calls 911 to report an overdose. And it also expands the access to naloxone. And I have vowed that I will do everything I can in Sal's memory to save lives and raise awareness and do all I can. And I'm a proud member of the Addiction Task Force, which gives me a great platform and a bigger voice, so we're doing a lot in Camden County to save lives. Yeah, I know you've got some members out here as well. <laughs> Dr. Evans. Sure, so um, as commissioner for the city's Department of Behavioral Health, uh, obviously this uh, epidemic has had a tr uh, profound impact on both the city and my agency. And I think um, for me, I think it, it really brings home the the point of the complexity of dealing with addictions. Uh, you know, often we talk about not arresting our way out of these problems, but we also can't treat our way out. And I, I really appreciated the, the comments from the U.S. Attorney earlier, uh, because I, I do think that it's gonna take a comprehensive set of strategies for us to deal with this. 
And I think for us, I think this um, epidemic, as bad as it is, gives us an opportunity because for the first time that I can uh, remember in, in my career, that we have a lot of people that are paying attention to this. And I think for the first time, we're hearing people talk about this issue in the right way, not just from a law enforcement standpoint, but really talking about what are we going to do to help people. So um, I think we have to seize the moment and, and use this opportunity to, to really push forward a, a, a set of policies that make sense for helping people who are addicted. Dr. Evans, thank you. Fred. Sure, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm on my 30th year in law enforcement uh, this month, and what we're doing is not working. We've seen, just in Ben Salem Township, which we're just to the north of Philadelphia, we've seen a 65% increase in overdoses from 2014 to 15, and we've also seen a 37% increase in arrests. So we're, we're arresting a lot of people, but the overdoses aren't going away. We've seen a 178% increase from 2005 to 2015. And we have to start thinking outside the box. It's not a law enforcement problem by itself. It's not a rehabilitation problem or an educator's problem. It's all three of us need to work together. One part of this will not work. If you cut law enforcement out, it won't work. If you cut rehabilitation, we need people, we find people that need beds every single day and there just aren't enough beds for these people. And I'm not talking about a 10 day or 28 day intake. We're talking about 30, 60, 90 to start. And the insurance company should not be the ones in charge of this. It should be the doctors and the rehabilitation experts. Those are the experts. Those are the ones who should be making the decision. And we need to work together. <laughs> We, we need to work together. 85% of our crime is because of the drug problem. People don't break into your house or break into your car to pay their Comcast or Pico bill. <laughs> they do it to get their next high. It's a fact. Any of the law enforcement folks here will tell you that. So if we see a reduction in people that need the drug, that people don't want the drug, we're going to see less crime. So it's what I signed up for 30 years ago. We have every officer carries the Narcan. And what we've just instituted, a little ahead of schedule, thanks to NBC, <laughs> we weren't quite ready, but we're up and running, is uh, the Gloucester, Massachusetts uh, program, the ANGEL program. We're calling them navigators. But we're taking it to the next step. Every officer within the next month or so in Ben Salem will be trained in kind of addiction and realizing people that need help. When we come across people that need the help, we're going to try to convince them to go get help. People that come in and call us 24 hours, seven days a week. You call 911, we're there in three minutes. We don't charge and we're not closed on holidays. We're there and we're going to get you to help and we're going to get you a bed. So, um, so as you saw in, in our short breakdown of our video, our presentation that we had, I lost my cousin, my family lost my cousin to this disease, so it's personal for me. But you know, even further than that, I just want to share just one piece, one post that some uh, woman, a woman, a mother-in-law <coughs> sent to us today. Uh, and we get these every single day, even before we did this project and continuing today. This is from Amanda Ruby. She's from Norristown. She says, I have a son-in-law who is struggling really bad on heroin. He finally gets up the will to go and get help, and the hospital didn't do anything for him but call places, and they all said that they had no rooms available, and that to go to the place tomorrow or call to get an appointment to make an assessment. What happens if tomorrow never comes for him? He went in and got turned down and turned away, and now who's to say that he will want to go in again? He cried, he pleaded for help, and told them that if he didn't get the help he needs now, he feels he'll be dead in a week. How is he at 25 going to get the help if he's getting turned away? That's why we do this. This could be any one of us or any one of our family members. So thank you. So my name is Devin Reeves, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that means I haven't used a drink or a drug since August 21st, 2007. <laughs> and I guess the reason I got involved is uh, I just got tired of my friends dying. Uh, my best friend from high school overdosed and died, and his father found him with a needle in his arm. and. Uh, he was so handsome and funny and charismatic, and it just didn't make sense to me. And at this time, I was in recovery several years, and I said, you know, I'm going to do something to make a difference. So I started getting involved. I went back to school. Uh, I got my master's degree, and I started learning, actually interned at uh, DBHIDS. And I, I learned about how we as a system can look at substance use disorder 
And we have a lot of great things in place, but there's still a lot of things missing. So I said, all right, well, what can I do? So I opened a recovery residence, and I started providing support for young men getting out of treatment, because that's where people fail, right? Somebody goes to treatment for 28 days, it's not enough, they can't go back home, that's not a supportive environment. So let me use what I've learned in graduate school and in college and my own journey in recovery and try to support them. And, and it's tough work, um, don't make a lot of money, but I help change people's lives. Uh, if I could leave you with one thing, I had one of my alumni uh, text message me the other day, he's a student at Drexel University, and he got a 3.4 GPA. And uh, there was a time where he couldn't imagine that, and that's just awesome, and that's what recovery is about. So our first set of three sets of questions have come from NBC10 journalists. And um, the first one is about what happened after we aired Generation Addicted and the amount of uh, feedback we got via social media, both positive and negative, and about addiction being so-called a choice as opposed to a disease. So I know we've heard from Secretary Tennis and also from Director Botticelli about the stigma surrounding this. So what can we do? And we'll start with you, Director, but please, this is a discussion, so chime in as you see fit. Um, how can we combat that stigma that's affecting this issue? So, so this is a really important issue because we, you know, we can have all the treatment and recovery support services available, but if fundamentally people are ashamed to ask for help if parents are afraid to, to uh, uh, be open about the problem, it's not gonna help. And I think there are a number of things that we can do. And one, we talked about it, Jason talked about it, is just really making this a personal issue. You know, I have yet to meet a family that hasn't been impacted by this, yet addiction has been shrouded in silence and secrecy and people have been afraid to talk about it. But I think we're at a tipping Point. And I think we have a revolution now, thanks to people like Devin and others that are creating an atmosphere where it's really important for people to be honest and open about their struggles. That's what changed hearts and minds, is if we know each other, we change people's opinion about this. And I think that's really important to do. The other thing that we've really been promoting, and we've seen this time and time again with other issues, is changing our language around addiction. Mm -hmm. So a, a friend of mine, Dr. John Kelly at, uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, did this study where he gave two therapists identical scenarios and in one scenario he called the person a substance abuser and in the other one he talked about the person as a person with a substance abuse disorder and what he found was even among trained professionals when you talked about someone as a person with a substance use disorder it was a, a much more likely to elicit a therapeutic response than a punitive response so when we call people addicts and junkies and substance abuser. We're sending a very clear message about uh, how still highly stigmatized we're reviewing people and that they are not worthy of care because it says I'm bad, I'm doing this of my own choice. So one of the simple things that we can do is not only be out and open about our own recovery, but, but use non-judgmental language when we, when we talk about addiction. The other piece, and I'm happy to share the stage with my good friend, Dr. Arthur Evans, is having communities that support recovery. So, you know, I was here in Philadelphia. I heard about this march for a very, very long time. And so in September, I, I joined 25,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia um, promoting recovery because we need for people to see that there's hope on the other side of addiction and that you have this great and wonderful life. And, and when communities support people in recovery, that really diminishes stigma as a, as a community as well. So thank you. Dr. Evans, do you want to add to that? Or? Dr. Botticelli said everything I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, Devin. Yeah. 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 Well, but uh, one thing I do want to say is, like, you know, I, you know, I'm so proud of Devin and, and people like Devin. I, when, you know, I always get a little choked up when people say, I'm in long-term recovery, and that means. Because when I came into the field, you know, it was all about anonymity. It was all about people not sharing that. And I think, um, just as you're saying, that when people stand up and you know, you're, you're nicely dressed, you're a handsome young man, <laughs> uh, and you say, you know, I'm in recovery, I think it really uh, changes people's perception about what recovery is all about. So, uh, so one thing I want to add is, uh, and I'm going to steal this one from Director Botticelli, you know, it's hard to hate up close. And you know, it's, it's really imperative that people in recovery and families that have been affected talk about it. Uh, you know, I work with families all the time. I was working with a, a, a mother from South Jersey, and she said to me, this doesn't happen to our people, right? And, and I said to her, no, no, 
honey, if this happens to your people, you guys just don't talk about it. <laughs> and, and that's what we need to, to, to change. And you know, there's all these great things happening in Philadelphia, all over the country. Recovery high schools like the Bridgeway School, collegiate recovery programs at St. Joe's University. And those are beacons of hope, right? I've met kids that are at the collegiate recovery program at St. Joe's that help other kids find recovery because they know that that's there. Right? And if we step out of the proverbial closet and we say, this is what recovery looks like. Because of my recovery, I'm a father. I have a beautiful woman in my life. I have a business. I, I have a car that I own. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a homeowner. That's what really changes it. it you know, because addiction is about people and recovery is about people. But those stories need to be in the forefront for that That's reason. Right. That's right. You know, in the media and everybody, we have to put those stories in the forefront because families have to know they cannot be embarrassed of it because if parents are embarrassed and their child is struggling, then how does that child feel? Mm -hmm. You know, the parents are embarrassed of their disease. So it's very imperative to keep that in the forefront. Yeah. Vince, did you want to comment on that? Just no, I think that Patty, Patty hit right on the head for me. You know, that's, we have a responsibility as journalists to do this, to tell these stories responsibly, a responsibility to tell responsibly. Um, but uh, basically, it's our job to tell the story correctly. Um, and I think for a long time, media in general just uh, stigmatized the entire mm -hmm. population. Uh, around it and glorified it, and now we're finally at a place where we're not afraid to talk about it. My own personal family, oh, I'm sorry, my family, uh, we didn't talk about my cousin uh, because they were embarrassed by it. And uh, same kind of thing, you know, uh, the South Jersey family, uh, you know, so it just is something that now, you know, I asked my aunt and uncle if I could share Jesse's story before we did uh, the project because I thought that it would do him justice uh, and help other people understand that you're not living alone with that, so. And now look how far it's come. Now there's yeah. a platform in which you share your story that before it was something that was hidden and kept secret. Exactly. Um, the next question from some of our reporters, the, the coroner, and I'm going to direct this to you, Fred, because you're f from the law enforcement perspective. The coroner in Lycoming, Pennsylvania, is now ruling heroin overdose deaths as homicides. Your thoughts on this, and will this help? You know, I, I've been following that. I, I don't think this, the judicial system is ready to do that. Um, I, I applaud his ideas, this coroner, but. We're just not ready to do that. We don't have the resources. Uh, you know, everything takes money. It, it takes money for beds. It takes money for law enforcement. We're being cut across the board in law enforcement. Money is not coming to fight this. It's not coming for more beds. So to label every single one a homicide is just going to bog down the system. And it's going to bog down investigators that now you're out there, you know, you have all these unsolved homicides, which are going to be a problem. Um, <clears throat> Is it suicide? Is it attempted suicide? You put a needle in your arm, it's attempted suicide as far as I'm concerned. But the mental health departments and the drug and alcohol departments need to come together. They're both separate. They need to come together. If you're sticking a needle in your arm in Delaware Valley, there's a pretty good percentage chance you're not going to see tomorrow. Uh, and we need to work together. So if you're, you know, to, to label it homicide, I don't know what good that's going to come out of it. And you're just, just going to lock up more people? That's not the answer. You see by our numbers. I didn't make these numbers. I didn't Google the numbers. They're my numbers from Ben Salem Township, a little small corner in the world. And we're making more arrests, but the overdose continue to rise. We're on course for this year to have a 75% increase in arrests, and our overdoses are on course to be over 70%. We've seen 170 some odd percent increase just over the last 10 years. So I'm not so sure that's the answer. You know, the last question about you know labeling it you know addict or is it a, a disease? We've been calling them addicts for all these years. There's a fine line sometimes with the general public, but what we've been doing is not working. The problem is that we're not seeing it getting better, it's only getting worse. So if we don't change our direction, if we don't change our course, it's, it's going to be unbelievable, the, the outcome of this, of this epidemic. I don't even know what the proper word would be. Um, so the answer to your question is, I don't know if that's the answer, labeling them all homicides. We don't have the, in, in Ben Salem, I don't have the resources to investigate these all as homicides. I'm sure the city of Philadelphia doesn't have the resources to invest every single overdose as a homicide. It's a problem. You do need, and, I, and I'm all for this, you find drug dealers, drug dealers. I'm not talking about the users now. The drug dealer, we should build jails and put them away. They are peddling poison as if they came into this country and unleashed Ebola. What will we do with that? They are peddling poison, and they need to be punished severely. I don't want to hear there's no room at the end. Put them in jail, and the dealer needs to be incarcerated. But we need to find help for the user. It is a balance of all three. One does not work by itself. 
Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I, I do agree that we have to be careful about this and we have to think about the populations. You know, Patty and many parents groups like her just really worked hard to change legislation to make sure that we are diminishing the barriers for people calling 911 to report an overdose. We know that that fear of arrest and prosecution to do that. And I agree with Fred that we need to save our law enforcement resources for those who are, you know, we part of the reason that we have, you know, the overdoses is the, and we heard it on the reporting, and not just here in Philadelphia, but across the country, you know, an explosion of very cheap, very pure heroin in many parts of the country. I know Philadelphia is not alone in seeing increases in fentanyl related overdose deaths, so we want to make sure that we're using our law enforcement resources to go after those folks who are flooding our communities with some of these substances and, and making sure that we are using our other limited resources to make sure that people are getting treatment and recovery to do that. And we're not going back and creating an atmosphere of, of where, where people are afraid to report an overdose because they're afraid of arrest and prosecution. You know, we have done, and law enforcement has done a remarkable job in terms of moving from that, and I don't want to see us backslide in terms of the progress that we've made. Okay. Now, Patty, I know this hits close to home for you, but families trying to get treatment for their loved ones face that hurdle of insurance companies mm -hmm. um, and trying to get, you know, negotiate the type and the length of treatment. So how do we go about changing that? What is your view on what's going to be, what can we do to fix that? I wish I knew what we could do to fix it. I don't, but they need to, I, I assume they need to change the criteria because I was always told that Sal didn't meet the criteria. I don't understand what the criteria was. You know, once I said heroin, they told me it was not a life-threatening disease and that he needed to detox first and you can't find detox and it's frustrating. You know, or if they did accept him, it was a very short time. After nine days, he'd be released because insurance would no longer cover him. You know, so we need to expand the criteria. Uh, so one really awesome thing that's happening. So what we talk about is if I break my leg, right, I can go to any hospital on the planet, insurance or not, and they're going to fix my leg up. Uh, but if I have a disease of a, of a substance use disorder and I say, like, listen, like, I'm shooting heroin and it's like going to kill me, they're like, I'm not really sure. I'm going to wait in the emergency room. The attitudes are going to be very poor. So looking at the way primary uh, care centers treat people with substance use disorders and changing the training that doctors, nurses, and pharmacists get in that setting is one big thing. And the second big thing, uh, straight out of the administration, is, is uh, President Obama just put into place a parity task force because we did pass a law several years ago uh, that was you know, really an awesome bill saying that we're going to treat physical ailments like my broken leg and you know, kind of neck up issues like mental health issues and substance use disorders the same way. However, that bill hasn't been really enforced in the way a lot of uh, recovery advocates would have liked. Uh, so I think that parity task force is good, and I think every state is different. Sometimes it's like the insurance general that needs to look at it. Sometimes it's the district attorney, because we know that these insurance companies are breaking the law, but nobody's going after them. And that's my understanding. So, so I just want to follow up on that. It was important. And, and actually, this came from a lot of our conversations with parents over the years. Uh, and so, you know, Devin's right. The Affordable Care Act did kind of two major things. One, it made sure that substance use and mental health benefits were part of essential benefit, health benefit package. And it said, as Devin talked about, that those benefits have to be provided the same way we do medical and surgical benefits. Mm -hmm. but, but over the years, we continue to hear reports, many from parents who have been in insurance and feel like either they're not being able to access treatment or they're not getting the duration of treatment that they mm -hmm. feel is important to do that. So, uh, so uh, just two weeks ago, as part of his visit to Atlanta, the president announced a task force that is going to work with every senior administration official and do outreach uh, to parents and other stakeholders to gather information and see what more we need to do at the federal level to enforce uh, federal parity rules. Uh, states also play a role, and state insurance commissioners also play a role. So I think one of the things that we can all do is educate ourselves on what the parity law means and look at what, are, what is the comp complaint process to do that. Because whether it's the federal government or state insurance, unless people are filing complaints, about it, they can't do anything about it. So, so this is, I think, an opportunity to educate ourselves and to take further action as it relates to making sure that particularly insurers are meeting the letter of the law as it relates to parity. Okay. So we're gonna move on our conversation with questions that have come through social media. 
The first one comes from John Smith, and uh, he's pretty bold in what he has to say. He says, I only have one question, the same question I've been asking NBC ever since it started the campaign. Why all the compassion and care and decriminalization after the white middle class demographic became hostage to smack? Drugs and alcohol have plagued the poor minority community for ages, but it wasn't until the quote unquote high school musical white generation got caught in the web, did the government create Narcan and allocate millions all to save those dear white children? So how would you address John Smith's question? Uh, I'll start and folks can chime in. Um, you know, I, 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 the, the way that I talk about this is I think we've learned a lot in the past 30 years in terms of our response to, to addiction. You know, I've been doing, a lot of people who've been up here have been doing this work for a long time and have fundamentally understood that issues around addiction ha have roots in social justice, have roots in how we treat our most vulnerable uh, and marginalized people. And a lot of us have dedicated our lives to that. You know, I, I, I will use what Arthur's uh, said, that we have a unique moment in time here where there is so much attention on this issue. And in some respects, you know, I don't care how we got here, but we're here. Mm -hmm. And we have an opportunity here to, to make sure that we're implementing solutions that work for everyone. And that we're using and implementing solutions that particularly work for some of our most marginalized and, and uh, uh, some folks who have been, <coughs> excuse me, have had histories of incarceration around this. So, you know, I, I, I do think that we have to use this as an opportunity to make sure that we're implementing the solutions for everybody uh, as it relates to this epidemic. Devin. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I really, you know, I can understand that gentleman's frustration. Uh, you know, when I look at the treatment facility I work at and my recovery residence, it is a lot of middle class people. And I know that substance use disorder does the effects of it. So we're um, young black men and boys are more likely to go to jail for drug and alcohol use, but are less likely to use drug and alcohol than their white counterparts, right? So that's the research is out there for that. Uh, and what we really need to talk about is how we build a constituency of consequence together because there are activists in the black community that have been working on this since the crack epidemic of the 80s, right? There's people in the harm reduction community that have been working on this issue since the HIV epidemic. And now there's this new recovery advocacy movement. So organizations like Young People in Recovery, Unite, ARS, and then there's also um, the parents groups, right? So like Patty's group and other groups that are totally awesome like that. And we all have to work together because that's the only way that change is gonna be made, right? We, we have to speak with one voice that says, we're not gonna pay for more bars, more guards. We're not gonna pass laws or allow um, bureaucrats to say that we're gonna change policy. We want access to treatment, we want it now. We want long-term treatment for people. We want recovery support services. We want Narcan. We want compassionate social justice system, uh, compassionate criminal justice system. And we're not going to stop until we get it. We have a question from Melissa Blair from Morristown, New Jersey. She asks, why are we continuing to use opiates for pain management and creating more addiction? Which also leads to the question of the role that uh, pharmaceutical companies have in this crisis. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's, that's a, that's, you know, what happened to 800 milligrams of Motrin? It, it used to work, it still works. You know, a couple years ago, I had a bad fall, broke my arm. Within a 24-hour period, they gave me oxys. I had a reaction. They wrote me Percocet. I had a reaction. I then was able to take Vicodin for four days and destroyed all three. I could have went to Hawaii if I sold those pills. But how come nobody was collecting them back? We are out of control on these doctors prescribing and prescribing. And you hear that same story over again from the people we come in contact with. How'd you get started? And you know, doctors are some. Some of them are talk, talking people into taking the medication. Just just take the ten pills. Just take the thirty. Just take the prescription in case you need it. Uh, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I don't understand. You know, give them just a few pills if that's what it that's what it needs. We're over prescribing, and that's and I think that's where a lot of the changes come. Where, you know, Tylenol three with codeine back when I was a kid. That's what. You know, people used if you had, you know, the coughs and you had some pain and, uh, you know, 800 milligrams of Motrin, you know, that's what people use. Now we're just quick to prescribe everything. And the truth, truth is, you know, Purdue Pharmaceutical made a lot of money on, you know, on prescribing oxys. And when oxys got, you know, crazy in this country in the 90s, uh, it, it just went nuts. And they're just making tons of money. You just really need to stop it. It needs to be controlled. Um, people doctor shop, people pharmacy shop. Uh, there's the, the, uh, the Pharmaceutical Accountability Act, which is being brought into legislation soon. That should help a little bit. 
but the doctors need to be, you know, a little bit better control. It's hard to investigate doctors. You know, pain management clinics are just off the charts. We don't need the amount of pills that are out there. You know, we send letters to doctors that if we come across somebody that overdosed or by accident or attempted suicide and they had a prescription from Dr. A, B, or C, we send a certified letter to that doctor saying your patient overdosed on your medication. Whatever the doctor does with that information is their business, but if we find that they're selling their pills that they're prescribed, and I've gotten any doctor that's called me has thanked me for that letter saying that, thanks for letting me know that there's a problem with this because we had no idea. And it's just another thing you could do outside the box. It doesn't cost any money, but maybe it'll make one doctor think about writing that prescription for that Percocet because whatever you want to call addicts are very good at conning people into getting the drugs. And you know, they con the doctors into getting them and they get them on the street. It is overprescribed and it's out of control. And I, the government needs to come down in controlling this a little bit more. But the doctors should know. That's their patient. They should know their patient and they should know their background. They should not be over prescribing. They should be following up when somebody's prescribed a narcotic. Instead of, you know, calling the office and you say, oh, my prescription right now, can you write me more? And they do it, no problem. Sure. And we need to educate our doctors. And I know that in Camden County we are doing that. We're having seminars and we're educating our physicians on the dangers. And, and I think in, in addition to uh, educating, I think people have to be held accountable. You, you were talking about uh, making sure that drug dealers go to jail. I think that some physicians need to go to jail because of their prescribing practices. And until that happens, we're going to we're going to continue to be plagued with pill mills in our communities and people who are, are practicing in ways that are just are really unethical and, and dangerous and, and, and killing people. So I want to see people held accountable. Let me talk about what we're doing on the federal level because I think, you know, it's hard to look at those numbers where every American is getting a bottle of pain pills <laughs> and, and not see that we're, you know, um, over prescribing. You know, we clearly want people in pain to have adequate pain management. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Centers for Disease Control came out with new prescriber guidelines, mm -hmm. particularly as it related to chronic pain. And what it says is basically that there is scant evidence that people in chronic pain actually do well on opioid therapy for a long time. And they're actually saying that we should be looking at alternatives to opioid, uh, opioid uh, prescribing for those uh, uh, instances. And also talking about acute pain, of making sure that we are giving the lowest dose in the lowest amount possible to be able to do this. I think the second piece we talked about this is the availability of prescription drug monitoring programs. Mm -hmm. of, of So physicians and other prescribers have the opportunity to check a database to make sure that someone's not going from doctor to doctor to do that, or getting drugs in combination that we know are uh, lead to higher overdose risks, like benzodiazepines and, and opioids, to be able to do that. But, but here's a couple other things. I, you know, we continue to press for mandatory prescriber education. We are 10 years into this epidemic, and I do not think it's unreasonable to ask a prescriber to take four hours of education as it relates to safe and effective opioid prescribing. We have 14 states now that have passed uh, uh, opioid prescribing. Um, you know, we were very happy that we got commitments from 60 medical schools across the country that will affirm that they will train every medical resident on safe and effective opioid prescribing by the time that they graduate. Because some of this is not about bad doctors. It's about prescribers who got little to no education around addiction in general and, and pain prescribing. And I'll just say this, there was a general accountability office study that showed actually veterinarians get more training on pain prescribing <laughs> than physicians do in the United States. So yes, we've got some bad docs that we've got to go after. But you know, we need to do a better job at educating the medical community on addiction in general, and particularly on safe and effective opioid prescribing. I just want to follow up. Just uh, when we went to Gloucester, Massachusetts, and talked to Chief Campanello up there as part of the program, uh, and uh, he is very adamant, and he reminds me of Fred, they, uh, they're lost souls, uh, very adamant about holding the pharmaceutical companies liable. Um, so I would love to hear what people, stakeholders in this issue feel their role should be in this, seeing as the, the pills, while they are being prescribed, are causing the major bulk of this problem. I mean, if we look at like big tobacco or other class action <coughs> lawsuits. Um, so the city of Chicago did bring up a lawsuit against a pharmaceutical company, right? And the 14th richest family in the country makes Oxycontin. So there, in my mind, and this isn't, this is kind of divisive, sorry. Uh, there's no difference between people that make billions of dollars selling hair, uh, Oxycontin and people that make billions of dollars that are, you know, um, drug cartel 
people. That's just my opinion. But the way we get to it is it's through the legal system, right? So cities going after these um, companies and saying, hey, we want the money. And then it's going to be go all the way up to the Supreme Court. So that's really, in my opinion, speaking to some lawyers and some things like that, how it's going to happen. But we need to, you know, wage a war on these people on the PR front. We need to say, hey, it's not okay. Because we all remember in the 90s what drug reps were like. Right, they were can't. Hey, go to the football game, do my thing, and then the federal government said, "Whoa, this isn't okay." We've got commercials on TV where they say, "Hey, are you taking too many opioids?" And you can't have a good bowel movement. We got a pill for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So let's let's talk about that. That's how much they're prescribing it. They're coming out with pills to fix the poop problem. <laughs> you know, so we have to address them having commercials on television. We have to address their predatory practices of drug reps, and we have to take them to the Supreme Court. We have a, a social media question from Janet Follow. She writes, I know Narcan saves lives, but within hours, the addict, in parentheses, my son, mm. is back out on the streets getting more heroin. They should be sent directly to inpatient rehab for at least 90 days and then to aftercare that is not going to cost. There should be no option for them to just walk out. Is this realistic? She asks. Yeah. Yes. We, we actually we see this over and over again. We, we just had a couple of weeks ago in 11 hours period, a uh, couple was in a hotel room, a uh, cardiac arrest call comes out, he gets Narcan, take to the hospital, he gets released from the hospital, goes back, then she shoots up and she's in cardiac arrest, and then Narcan and go to the hospital. Uh, uh, another young lady was Narcan, talked to the hospital, released from the hospital, and then went through an intersection, got hit by a car. So the hospitals are releasing. The, the Narcan is just, as I, I think I said, I, I talked to another group this morning, it's a Band-Aid on a bleeding artery. It's a good thing because it does save lives, but it doesn't stop there. The hospitals are cutting people loose because they got no room at the end either. Um, people need treatment. The Narcan is not the solution, not to just arm everybody with Narcan so they take that high to the ultimate level and think that their partner is going to have Narcan. We're seeing this over and over again where we're Narcan the same person two, three times and eventually they die. Uh, we just had a 20-year-old girl that died in the woods, you know, across from the PennDOT driver's license building. The last thing she saw when she closed her eyes was the lights of the PennDOT building, uh, you know, in, in our township. The, the Narcan is, is not necessarily the answer. It is a good fix right now, but there needs to be a lot more. We don't have the, and I, I've said it, and, and again, it's a three-wheel process. And if you don't have the rehabilitation, and again, not the 10 days, it's got to be 30, 60, 90, whatever it might be, 120, they need the treatment because it doesn't work. The system doesn't work without that treatment. And you know, being in law enforcement for 30 years, I, it comes to the point where treatment is the key right now. Uh, everything else needs to be in place too, but the Narcan alone does not do it. And people are just repeating their, their bad, bad act, if you will. Yeah, well, I think there are a couple of uh, pieces to this. One is to, to have treatment on demand. And I think that uh, until we have enough capacity in this country so that the moment the person says, I want to go into treatment, they can go into treatment, uh, we need to continue to work on that. I think the other part, though, is, is the, um, the insurance piece of this. Because, you know, even if we have the, the access to services, we want to make sure that people can actually get into the services and have those services paid. So I think we have to work on, on both fronts. And I think we also have to make sure that we have policies around access to services that align with what the science is. So you, know, you mentioned uh, 90 days. So well, it turns out that at least you know, what the research says is that um, the minimum dose that you need for residential treatment for most people is about 90 days. So you're right on, on the money on that. And, you know, that's something that the science tells us. And, and so when we have insurance policy does, that doesn't follow the science, we need to push back on that. And it goes to the issue around parity. Um, we don't accept suboptimal treatment for other conditions. We should not accept suboptimal treatment for, for addiction. And so I think it's going to take... So I think it's going to take some pushback uh, in, in terms of that. And the last piece I'll say on this is that uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the need to have protocols at the local level, uh, because all healthcare is local. But we need to have protocols with hospital systems and the um, behavioral health systems, the addiction treatment system, so that when that person comes in, it's really clear. The nurse doesn't have to figure out or go to a Rolodex, but there's a clear protocol about what you do when that person comes to the door. Uh, you've had a Narcan uh, reversal. How do you connect that person to treatment? You know, one of the things, 
that I think is important to talk about. And you know, everybody is absolutely right. But but you know, the other piece too is we have three highly effective medications for the treatment of people with opioid use disorders: methadone, suboxone, uh, and injectable naltrexone. It doesn't mean that they're used in isolation. They have to be done, you know, people need the full complement of other behavioral and recovery supports to be able to do that. But they are highly underutilized. And you know, one of the things that we see often with people with opioid use disorders who relapse, who have repeated overdoses, is not only do they not get into treatment, but they're also not getting access to the right treatment. So the scientific evidence is pretty clear that people do, people who have an opioid use disorder, when they're on one of these medications with all the other supports, do far better in terms of ongoing recovery than people who don't. And they don't die. So, so, so part of what we have to do is to look at making sure that people have access, both in terms of insurance, but within our treatment programs, within our criminal justice programs. There was actually an emergency room that just did this interesting study for people who overdosed. They started them on buprenorphine administration within the emergency department, and they found much better results of keeping people engaged in treatment. So part of what our job is at ONDCP is to take some of these innovations that are happening at the local level. So whether it's the police assisted recovery initiative or some of these other uh, and, and look at how do we stand those up for replication across the country because we do have to do a better job at getting people to the right treatment at the right time when they need it. And I, I think this brings up another issue. So you mentioned methadone. I mean, the, the pushback from communities around siting of programs is something we have to talk about. So these issues are, are affecting everyone. It's not, it doesn't happen in my community. In fact, in Philadelphia, it took us seven years to site one methadone program in a part of the city where we had a lot of overdoses because people believe that these are people coming into our community. These are not people in our community. So we have to deal with the issue around, of, of NIMBY and people yeah. saying, not in my backyard. We have to deal with that issue. Um, Devin, you had a yeah, comment. Yeah, I, I, mean, I was pretty much going to say the same thing. It's, it's two things. So I'm a social worker, right? Uh, I have my MSW, went to the University of Pennsylvania, great school, yada, yada, yada. So you have to, uh, on the higher end of treatment, and really when you're working with cl clients with dual diagnosis, you have to have a master's degree to work there, right? It costs a lot of money to get a master's degree. And we need to address the reimbursement rates uh, across the board because I have student loans I have to pay. And what providers are paying their clinicians isn't enough. And we have burnout, we have people that can't stay in the field, and good clinicians leave. That's a big part of the problem. And uh, you know, NIMBY, everyone says this affects them. You, I, they almost kicked me out of the Germantown when I tried to open my recovery house. I thought they would have burned, me, burned it down. And nobody wants us there. You know, we don't want those people. And that's something that really needs to be addressed because there's illegal laws in the books that say you can't have a recovery residence here, you can't have this, you can't have that. And I get it, it's, it's not easy. But if there's, it doesn't matter how many treatment beds there are because somebody needs to go to a recovery residence afterwards. And there's nowhere near enough recovery residence beds in southeastern Pennsylvania or South Jersey. We are going to move the discussion on to our third and final set of questions uh, that has been sent in by the folks here in the audience at the National Constitution Center. Uh, this one comes to us anonymously, but asks, what is the current treatment capacity in Philadelphia? If we filled every spot currently available in Philadelphia recovery programs, <laughs> would anyone be excluded from treatment? I guess you're looking at me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, actually, as cities, as large cities go, the, the capacity is, is probably better than, than most places. Uh, for example, with residential treatment, most times, you know, most parts of the time of the year, you can get access to residential treatment probably within 24 to 48 hours. My director of addiction services back there nod uh, approvingly. Yes, he, he's nodding, so <laughs> I know that I'm saying that right. Um, but you know, the, 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 but here's the thing: 90% of the people who have addiction and who are in need of treatment aren't accessing treatment. So if we filled all of the current capacity, and if we doubled it, and if we tripled it, we would still not have enough capacity for all of the people who who um, have an addiction. So I think that one of the things our field has to do is to look at uh, alternative pathways for people getting into recovery. I mean, I know so many people who, you know, in addition to having a strong treatment system, 
Uh, there are many people who get into recovery not through the traditional treatment system. And if we're going to really take a public health approach to this, I think we have to look at and be open to all of the pathways that people can use, whether that's through the faith community, which I've seen many, many people uh, who've gone through detox after detox, rehabilitation after rehabilitation, but it's not until they get religion that they, that they uh, are able to get into sustained recovery. I think our field and the community has to be open to whatever pathway is going to work for people um, and to make sure that we um, uh, build the capacity in all the ways that we can. Okay, now, yes. So, so the, the money that Secretary uh, Tennis gets <laughs> and Commissioner Evans gets in, in a large part comes from the federal government as well. And I think that we've acknowledged that we need to do a better job at increasing. You know, Dr. Evans talked about that this epidemic has really underscored some longstanding issues in the field of substance use disorder treatment. And one is the vast under treatment, uh, underfunding of, of treatment issues. And the president has acknowledged that. And despite everything that we've done, he's put $1.1 billion, the biggest investment in substance use disorder treatment ever in the United States as an acknowledgement that we need to close this treatment gap. We can't have people blogging saying, I'm gonna, you know, I have to wait till tomorrow to get a bed. That's really unacceptable and so part of what we've trying to do. And states and locals have a role to play too in terms of you know, helping to fund this issue. Um, but, but you know, fundamentally that you know, the federal government has stepped forward and the president has stepped forward saying despite everything that we've done, we have a huge treatment gap in the United States. We do have multiple pathways. You know, we've been engaging faith communities who have long had a long history in helping uh, uh, families and people with substance use disorders. So we really need everyone engaged but we also know that we do need to make sure that we're closing this treatment gap. Can I add one other point? Because I, I think, in, and I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Michael Botticelli is at uh, ONDCP because you know, you're a person who understands sort of the complexity of treating addiction. And one of the ways the federal government can help is um, by making sure that the other resources that people need in terms of engaging in their recovery are there. Top of the list is housing. Uh, when people don't have... And people don't have adequate housing, and that, that's one of the, the, the consequences of, of being addicted and having a serious addiction. You, you lose your housing. And so we can provide all the treatment in the world, but if a person doesn't have a place to stay, it doesn't work. Uh, I'll give you an example. In, in Philadelphia, previous mayor negotiated uh, Section 8 housing vouchers. Uh, we were able to get 800 people who were living on the streets over an eight-year period uh, off of the streets and into permanent supported housing by leveraging Medicaid dollars with Section 8 housing vouchers. Uh, that never would have happened if there wasn't a recognition that you know it's not just treatment, it's this other piece of, of having housing. I think the other, the other piece is uh, around employment because one of the big challenges we have is that we can treat people, we can get them to a point, but if they have no way to take care of themselves, or their families, it really undermines their ability to stay in long-term recovery. So again, there's another area where I think uh, looking at our policies, um, both in the private sector and the public sector around uh, employment, around housing, uh, around access to education, I think is really important. Okay, let, let me just, uh, I just want to underscore that because the biggest issues I hear, you know, when I travel the country and other people about sustained recovery or housing and employment. And part of what we're trying to do, particularly in the employment area, is to look at particularly those folks with criminal records and how do we create, and we've been working with employers nationally to implement what's called ban the box, right? So this is an opportunity for folks and employers to make sure that they're not asking on the front end of applications what someone's criminal history is and waiting till much further in the process. But this is where locals can play a role, where employers at the local level Level can help by pairing up with treatment programs and others to creating those employment opportunities for people to give them a second chance. Because we can, again, you know, we can give people all the treatment that we want, but unless you have a stable place to live and if you have a way, and, and unless you have a way to financially sustain yourself, you know, your recovery is going to be in jeopardy for a very, very long time. And that's where we need community solutions. We can do what we can at the federal level, but we also need chambers of commerce and employers and, uh, and landlords involved in creating those opportunities opportunities for people so that we have a community that embraces recovery mm -hmm. for people who, who need it. I think that that also stands with employment as far as being drug tested when you're working. Yes. Instead of firing someone on the spot yes. who's test positive, yes. give them a second chance. Yes. You know, work with them and put them in recovery, give them that chance and that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
We have time for, unfortunately, just one more question. But this question comes from the audience, of course, and it asks, should naloxone be over the counter? Yes. yes. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> says shout again. Not only should it be over the counter, it is over the counter. Yeah, it is. Our physician general signed a statewide standing order that anybody in the state can get Narcan. And that's awesome. We've got to go out there and talk about it. Right? We, we, need, we need our Patty Dorenz to go up and put up billboards, to go to the neighborhoods that are marginalized and hand out placards, because there's a lot of people both that on the using end and the parent end and also in the enforcement and police officers that just don't know about it. But would you recommend that everyone, each one of us, goes to you know, wherever we need to go and go get it right no. now? It should be in every first aid kit in every home. I, That's you know, what I believe. So I just want to push back on that a little bit. So. As we all know, the price of Narcan has gone up, and there really hasn't been the same outrage as when you know, Pharma Bro or whatever his name was raised the price for the HIV medications. But there should be, and that's another conversation. But if people are buying Narcan that don't have a reasonable idea that they might use it, it's going to continue to push up the price. And there's also a limited demand at this point because all over the country we're seeing more people getting Narcan. So what I always tell parents is if if you live with somebody that has a substance use disorder or you think that there's any chance that you could witness an overdose, then you should try to have it. And you should know the signs. And if you do, don't have it, you should immediately call 911. Yeah. I think there's this, this big fear amongst family members. And I guess it goes back to the idea of stigma about having it in their house. Well, if I have Narcan, then that means that my kid's going to go out and use heroin. But it could happen just like an EpiPen, just like anybody having some sort of anaphylactic shock. It's just being prepared, and you never know who you might come into. So if you have a first aid kit in your car, or you have a first aid kit in your house, it's just being prepared, just like anything else. I, I will tell you that the FDA is very interested in looking at an approval of over-the-counter. It, it actually requires a company to come forward with an approval process to do that. I think that uh, many of you might know the FDA has been expediting approval of uh, naloxone devices. So they just uh, did an expedited uh, approval on the nasal administration. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we, we've actually been working with a number of national organizations to establish a purchasing collaborative whereby uh, uh, mayors and counties and governors can uh, pool their collective purchasing resources to get the lowest prices possible. And then the, the third thing is we continue to put out grant dollars uh, through existing federal grants or new grants for naloxone purchase for first responders and other people to have access to it. And I think we have 35 states, if I remember correctly, that have some level of pharmacy access without a direct prescription. So we're interested in working with the remainder of those states uh, to look at how do we increase uh, naloxone access without having to get an individual prescription to do it. And we have 35 states that have developed some level of legislation around, around uh, better access to naloxone. There's just so much to talk about. I wish we could carry this conversation on further. But we run out of time. I want to thank Director Botticelli and the rest of our panelists for being here and being taking this discussion to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. If you have not had the chance already, I know you saw part of a Generation Addicted, and that was just a third of that. If you haven't had a chance, go to NBC10.com and check out the entire program, along with other stories that are, are written there, also video stories, um, because we just need to carry on this conversation and continue with it. Um, on behalf of all of us at NBC10, thank you for being here today. Thank you at home for joining us, and this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. This has been a special digital presentation from NBC10, Combating the Heroin Epidemic, a forum for change. For more information, visit NBC10.com and also visit HHS.gov opioid.